I chair a very wonderful department. There's actually a public-private partnership between a public university, Georgia Tech, and a private university, Emory, which is, which is in itself, itself a remarkable story. Um, but before I get started, I'll tell you a little bit, because I share the, uh, the podium with Bob Kirsch. We're both biomedical engineers. And what is it? So wherever technology meets health, that's where biomedical engineers play. So all your imaging system, nanotechnology, uh, precision medicine, trying to figure out which medicine will work for which person and not, not try it and then find out six weeks later if it's working or not working. Um, implants, big data, uh, many of you are wearing Fitbits and such. Uh, that is also impacting healthcare. So this is where biomedical engineers play. The other the remarkable thing about biomedical engineering is in many ways it's the energy in engineering. The best and the brightest wanting to go into engineering are actually coming to BME. And that's true at Case, it's true at Georgia Tech, it's true elsewhere. Uh, not only that, um, BME is one of the few engineering disciplines where the national average of women in engineering is about 20%. In BME, it's 50%. Okay? So it's a fantastic place for women to come into technology and STEM because of the meaning it offers and because of the coolness of some of the things we do, not just in our lab, but elsewhere. And the coolness comes from, and the meaning comes from, impacting health in, in a meaningful way. Just a couple of sentences about the department that I'm privileged to chair. We're very highly ranked, um, and it's a partnership with Emory, as I alluded to. And I'll just give you a couple of powerful ideas, or a few powerful ideas incubating in the department that is not all from my lab. I'll talk about devices and cancer in a second, but we also have a faculty who are thinking about how do we listen to and converse and modulate the brain? Can we talk and listen and modulate what the brain does? And the implications, as Mylon alluded to, are for Parkinson's disease, for Alzheimer's, and for uh, you know, uh, dementia, for multiple disorders. A lot of people are hear, hearing about the promise of stem cell therapy. You know, uh, nowadays the ethical things are a little bit behind us because we have this technology called IPS, which doesn't, you know, involve fetuses and things. So we have ways now which we have cells that are from adults. Not, so the ethical things are behind us, but yet it remains a mom and pop operation. Engineers are working on how to make that a robust therapy that is scalable and available to multiple people. Um, can we use our immune system to heal tissues rather than to take medicines to kind of bandage and manage injuries? And there's a fantastic area called immunoengineering where we engineer our immune system to help healing and we have a big effort in that space. Uh, I already talked to you about big data and analytics. We also have a healthy healthcare robot. Um, imagine a healthcare robot in every house that you can buy like your Roomba, but helps, helps you out with, with your healthcare. And, and it's not too far away, uh, I would submit. And we have some amazing um, uh, work in that space and in the cardiovascular space. So what I'd like to um, share with you now is you know, research from our lab, and I'll talk about brain cancer. Now at lunch, it's brain cancer. It's a little bit depressing, but I'll try, I'll try not, to, uh, not to do that too much. Um, and the unfortunate thing about brain tumors is that this is a table, uh, if you can see, I don't know, hopefully you can all see, um, the, the red lines are the two kinds of brain cancer where the needle for survival after five years has not moved since the 1960s. Most of you in this room were probably not born in that, by, by then. So this is pre-Nixon's war on cancer. And we've, this is not so for every cancer. In leukemia, we've made some incredible pro progress. In many cancers, we've made incredible progress, but not so in brain cancer. And there are two particular types of brain cancer. It's called glioblastoma, or GBM, <coughs> or astrocytoma. These are tough, tough tumors. And it is the leading cause of death in children after injury. And it is the leading cause of death. Sen Senator Kennedy passed away. Uh, so many, many, it, it affects many people. And it's a tough disease. The reason it's tough is because unlike other tumors, this is real histology pictures from human brains, brain tumor doesn't stay in one place. It has this unfortunate characteristic of being invasive, as in it doesn't stay in one place. It comes from a primary place here and then moves along, and there is no strict border for you to resect the brain cancer. In other cases, in breast cancer and other cases, if I fear that the tumor is migrating, then I can sacrifice the organ in some cases. Not so in the brain, right? 
So in the brain, in fact, if I'm aggressive as a surgeon and take out two millimeters more, I have collaborators who work closely with us. If you take two millimeters more, it could be the difference between speech or no speech, between walking or no walking. So you're always trying to balance taking out the entire cancer but preserving function as much as you can. And with a tumor that doesn't have an edge that's clearly defined. That is the challenge of treating brain cancer. So there are two ways to deal with this. So Jenny Munson is actually grew up in Marietta, not far from where I live. Um, asked the question, you know, is there something particularly nasty about brain cancer? Or if we somehow magically had a drug that contained its movement, would it respond to therapeutics that are already available? And she, we partnered with a, what I would call a mad chemist, Jack Arbizer here. Um, he's an MD, PhD from Harvard, works at Emory. Uh, and he works with plants and, and herbs and things and isolates compounds that could have therapeutic benefits. So he gave us 30 vials of different colored fluids to test for, to see if any of them satisfied this. Long and short, I'll, I'll cut the story down. This is a, a cancer in an example. This tells you in a, in a rat model why the cancer is tough. You can see these invading fronts and you can't resect this cancer here without sacrificing normal brain tissue. So we invented a nano carrier, Jenny did, um, and, and came up with a way to contain brain tumors but not kill them. Because when you have an invading front and you have normal tissue, you can't dump toxic things without hurting the t normal tissue. So we wanted to test the hypothesis. If I could just stop it, would it respond to normal therapy? And so this is just a picture to show you that we can contain it as opposed to the untreated side where it goes on both sides of the hemisphere. And then but Jenny showed, this is, I won't show you too many graphs, but this line means it's a good thing. 100% survived. And when Jenny showed that when you contain the tumor and then treat it with already approved therapeutics, no developing new drugs at $100 million a piece and things like this, you could get efficacy by, by an adjuvant approach where you turn the tumor into a known problem. And the known problem in this case is how to treat cancers that are not moving. So if I could con convert an unknown problem, this is how engineers solve problems, <laughs> you convert an unknown problem into a known problem, and that's what Jenny did here. And we published this paper and got some efficacy. And just so you know, this has real implications. The, the startup company, the technology was licensed, it raised some angel funding, it's in Atlanta, it's creating some jobs, and it's moving on. It may not cure brain cancer, but it's promising, and we're moving this, and would not be possible without federal support. <coughs> the second story I want to tell you is where the engineering comes in, and it's a little bit crazy. And that was about nanotechnology. We had to make nanocarriers to deliver drugs and things. And this crazy thought is, if gliomas and brain tumors are so invasive, can we, instead of fighting nature, somehow use that property against itself, right? And what would the world look like? And in concept, this is the idea, hopefully the movie plays here. Uh, so imagine a tumor that is deeply embedded, especially brainstem tumors where you can't do surgery. And because we know they try want to move along what we call white matter tracks, which are the nerves that are coursing through our brains, can we make an artificial white matter tract a track that mimics the structures that it would normally migrate along and entice it to migrate along a path that we specify. And if we could entice the tumor to invade, but invade along a path that we specify, could we tell it where to invade? And if we could tell it where to invade, could we make it X-wave instead of invade and come out of, its brain, out of the brain on its own volition and then collect the cells that are coming out and kill them outside the brain, right? Crazy enough? So, in fact, it was so crazy that nobody in the lab wanted to work on this project. They said, Ravi, you come up with crazy things every other day. This is really out there. So I had one person who was brave enough, Anjana Jain, a Hopkins grad actually, came to the lab, and she worked on this. And the idea was we had to make the structure that mimics how brain tumors, uh, normally they migrate along nerves, and so we used uh, uh, nanofibers, these are polymer films that are thinner than your hair. So your hair is about 25 microns, each strand. So this is 10 micron films of these oriented fibers. And basically she wanted to test to see if tumors will migrate along this and we could m entice them to move, but move along a path that we specify and collect them in a gel and kill them. So it was so crazy that we didn't want to do any animal experiments because we had no idea if this would work. So she, Anjana, for sure that in a gel, that we could take tumor cells that we get and put it in one gel, 
make our highway, if you will, we call it the tumor monorail. So if you can make a monorail here, and then would it move to this side? And we showed that we could indeed move cells from this gel to this gel, and they come over safely. If I put a drug here in this gel that kills cells, it would kill cells, and that's what the red is here. So we could, in principle, show in a dish, without sacrificing any animals that didn't need to be sacrificed, that this, in principle, worked. You could move cells, tumor, tumor cells, from one point to another point using our monorail. And if you had a drug in the destination point, you could kill them. So th we then went on to test in animals. She designed a little construct, where is a tube with the film in the middle. This is an MRI on a rat. Yes, it's possible, MRI on a rat. We have special MRI machines for that. This is a tube that is implanted in brain tumors, and, 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 and this is how the surgery looked. We want to make sure the brain tumor is there. You can implant your device, and the question is, does it move, does it work? And this is a picture, I won't go into all of the details. This is a tube without the center fibers, the films to entice the tumor to move. And this is a picture showing that all along the tube, and this is the different sections near the tumor and outside the brain, you could indeed move the tumor. And the green you see here is brain tumor cells that have been dyed green so we could see them. So you can indeed move tumor cells from inside the brain to outside on their own volition, no suction, no anything. You just put the thing in. They think they're invading along their normal paths and they invade along this. And this just shows you that we're able to kill them once you get them out of the brain. But then we had a question to ask. The question was, are we just giving more room for the tumor to grow? And tumor is saying, thank you very much for providing this highway, I'm just gonna grow more, or am I actually moving the cancer, right? We had to answer this question. And so we, try, we looked closely to see where was the cancer. And I'll just point you, I promise this is the only data I'll show you, or maybe there's one more. So this is just telling you where the tumor is, and this is the volume in the brain, and this is the volume in the tube, okay? If you look at the solid line, which is the case where we engineered these fibers for the tumor to move, you'd see that this, the volume in the brain has actually shrunk by more than 90%. Okay, and it's been displaced into the tube, which is where the tumor is here. So most of the tumor that was in the brain normally is now in this case where we engineered and offered the tumor a chance to migrate along a path, was able to migrate through and go into the tube and shrink in the brain. Okay, so this really works. We also made sure, this I won't go into this, that the tumor cells were not dividing anymore, so we were actually moving the tumor cells and such, and this was peer reviewed. And, and published, um, I think last year, uh, in a prestigious journal. Uh, and, it's in the, and got a lot of press actually. The BBC covered it, it was translated in like 45 languages, all this stuff. And because it's the first demonstration that you can engineer migration in vivo, inside the body, and move a tumor from point A to point B by design. And it was also the first demonstration of bringing the tumor to your drug rather than your drug going into valuable brain and killing normal cells and having side effects from killing normal cells, right? So it's, so it's kind of cool, actually. So we think that we are now in the process of designing this thing in a catheter system to include this, and we got a large grant from the Marcus Foundation. I was remiss to tell you that this whole research was funded by a National Cancer Institute grant called, uh, via their mechanism called Eureka for crazy ideas, and we were fortunate. We were the only second group in Georgia to ever get a Eureka grant, um, and uh, no one else since has gotten it. And that's what enabled us to do the proof of principle studies, now that we've leveraged to raise other monies from philanthropy and industry to try to take this forward. But would not have been possible without some combination of philanthropy and federal support. Now, if I went to a company, and a cancer company, or Roche, or, or Johnson & Johnson, and asked them for money for this, they would laugh at me, right? They'd be like, show me that it works before we even talk to you. But it takes money to figure out if it works or not, is worth pursuing or not. The other thing about this that's interesting is that ideas like this cannot be funded by any other agency but the US government and the NIH. The only other possibility is philanthropy and donors who, who, who I might happen to run into, but it's not a reliable source. Okay, so it is very important for federal support to continue in this space. I'll just take two more minutes and, and end on this thing. You might ask, what's happening with this? So it turns out that when I have this film in the cancer, indeed I'm shrinking the cancer and I'm moving cancer away, but the cancer on this side doesn't know that it needs to go only here and it's still continuing to go on this side. So there is still work to be done. 
If you look at the road, and when I drive on a road, and this is control systems in engineers, but I won't talk about it. Any, any stable system has what we call positive feedback. That is, I like a path or a road that is paved and I like to drive on, but I also stay on the road because the unpaved road I don't like, right? So I need both to be there for me to be guided, to be on a path. And indeed, we're working on a way to cause repulsive cues on the tumor on this side. So there is an escape valve for the cancer that we provide, but we also repel cancer on the other side, and we're working on that technology right now to control and maintain how tumors grow in things. Again, I hope I've given you an inkling. I, I have a movie here I won't show you in the interest of time, but I hope I've given you an inkling about A, the exciting work that's going on in this space, and this is out of the box, and we have several other ideas in the lab and others, other colleagues of mine who are working on revolutionary ideas to move the needle in meeting unmet <laughs> clinical needs and would not be possible without federal support and such. And so the take home messages I have is there are exciting things going on in our lab and my colleagues at Georgia Tech and elsewhere. NIH funding and NSF funding and DARPA funding is absolutely the lifeline for this because that's how innovation is spurred. Not only that, People like Anjana who, who go on and my students go on to work for companies as well as for universities are trained in lab settings that are funded by NIH and NSF. Um, is that me going out of time? I'm just kidding. So, uh, and so I, I deeply appreciate the work that you do and your support for research. And I'll end on the note that I am the president of AMB and Mylan alluded to this. This is one area where our country leads the world in medical technology. This is the one area. In pharma, we don't lead the world anymore, un unfortunately. And it is up to us to figure out if we want to continue and maintain that lead, and it translates to enormous implications for our national competitiveness. Second, this is the area that is attracting the best and brightest engineers to come into STEM. And this is the field that is driving women in engineering as well as minorities coming into engineering. And it is our responsibility, I feel, as an educator to, to do well by them and to have the funding base to support that. And so I, 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 I live on federal dollars in some ways. We leverage other dollars as well. And so I'm deeply grateful to the US taxpayers and the work that many of you do and will be doing in the future. I see a lot of young, young people here in the audience. So with that, let me turn over to Bob. And we can take questions in the end to make